Hi there, thank you so very much for clicking on this video. Really appreciate it. Favorite, favorite topic, or well, apart from everything else about orchids that I consider a favorite topic. The Rapiculus Lelia's general care in a care collab. Appreciate your time. I am here going to do these videos today together with Patricia's Orchids, Nicole Diana, and Matt by Nature. And every once in a while, you can see under the table, I've got my other sidekick here that is King. Right, so back to the Rapiculus Lelia's because what I've done here is I've pulled exactly the same ones that Matt by nature and I have in common. I do not have the ones that Patricia has, not yet. And I do not have the one that Nicole Diana has, not yet. I am expanding my Rapiculus Lelia collection. Currently, I count 20 of the species that I have. And I believe there's around 40. Initially, I thought 33, but I found another list. There's probably 40, so yeah. These are the four that I have in common with Matt by Nature, and that is Lelia Flava, Crispy Labia, Giuliani, and over there is Kautskiana. So I'm gonna keep calling them Lelia. They are in the process of possibly being reclassified, depending on the DNA, after I had a little conversation with Patricia. They're probably gonna be some of them Catlias, but I am seriously, seriously struggling with ever calling these cuties Catlias. So, Rapiculus Lelias, in my books, come from where else but Brazil, which seems to be the entire country loaded with the best goodies that any kind of orchid hobbyist or professional grower would want to have. They have it all. The big giants and then these cute little ones. In their natural habitat, and we will get to my care, as to what I am trying to do and achieve regarding what they find out in nature. Wherever they grow on is very sandy, it is rocky, it is not deep terrain, and for that reason it doesn't retain a lot of water. Even during the rainy season and during the drought months of the year, everything dries out very quickly. During the drought months of the year and the hottest months of the year, their only sustenance is the dew at night. And then imagine the sun rises and everything dries out. And during the rainy season, it can rain and pour, but because of where they are growing, it just washes away. So there is no retaining water around them. I am in Southern Spain and I have, I would say, perfect conditions to be able to grow these Lelias. And yet I have mine in semi-hydro and I'll get to that. So this terrain, raggedy, exposed terrain is mainly found in Minas Gerais. Espirito Santo and the Bahia, full on naked rock exposed to the heat in the drought season and in the rainy season. Well, not much water retention going on. Even my temperatures here in southern Spain is very similar to what they get in the natural habitat. So in summer I can go very hot, let's just say 40 degrees Celsius, just as a margin, not very often, but it can happen add to that the very hot, dry winds. It can feel hotter than 40 degrees. And in the winter, I can go all the way down to five degrees Celsius. And that is why these ladies can live outside in my climate all year round. In the winter, I have them a little bit more protected. They are in my blooming alley, right up against where the glass is of the living room. That is where they will get direct sun because of the angle of the sun being that much lower in the sky, that it comes through the trellising and they get sun from morning, afternoon to late afternoon on a sunny day, which I have plenty of here in Southern Spain. Winter, direct sun, a lot of light. In the summer, I move them away onto a little like side board, which used to be my barbecue table. <laughs> it's not anymore. And underneath there, now that table is located deep south by the hedge and they are all tucked away underneath that board because not all of mine are well established. I have a lot that are well established and some of them aren't. So I am not hitting them with full sun during the hottest time of the year. They are a lot more protected, but there is a lot of light and heat 
reflecting from the terracotta around them. Everything in my patio reflects white, so I consider that bright shade. Now the reason I am growing all of mine in a semi-hydro setup is because of convenience. I want to make it a little bit easier for me to cultivate these cuties and not lose out or do them an injustice. And that is why I have them in semi-hydro. I have not had a single one object to the rock, lava rock, semi-hydro setup in a small pot. And not because of the fact that the pot size wouldn't matter that much, but it's more convenient to have them growing in a small pot because they can stay in there for a long, long time without being disturbed. Another little thing about these is that they don't like their roots disturbed. Well, we've heard that before. And then if you do it at the right time, it really doesn't make a difference. Out of all the ones that I've had, I'm only struggling with two, and those are weak orchids. And it's the same thing over and over again. If you get a weak orchid, it'll take a lot more time to establish itself, get going, and it may even fail because the storage organs of these little guys are so small. That is why they are considered difficult to have in cultivation when you get them in fresh from a nursery, fresh in inverted commas, because if they are weak and they have these itty bitty little storage organs and there is nothing that they really have to work with, if they've been attacked by scale from their point of origin, it'll take them down really fast. The stress of transportation will do the rest. So to talk about them being difficult in cultivation, I would have to negate that, except for the two that I've gotten as weak plants. I may be losing one of them, but the other one is showing signs of recovery. And that is why those two are in my dining room area. They're not exposed to these elements out here at all. They're getting a little bit more baby to see if they will pull through. Another thing I do with the semi-hydro setup is I've got everything layered. This is my Lelia flower. Very big Rapiculus Lelia, probably the biggest of all the Rapiculus Lelias. Massive root system. I had it initially just in Lekka and it was absolutely a success. Lekka and self-watering. The root system that it developed within a very short period of time, the orchid was pot bound, but for aesthetic purposes and to get them all looking the same, I switched it from self-watering into a semi-hydro setup, as you can see here, into a bigger pot because Literally, the root system looked like a delicious bunch of spaghetti. Healthy, long, long roots, and it was happy in that very wet environment. So, just for aesthetics, I moved everything. I didn't have to, but I put it into a layer of Akadama, aquarium grit, and small lava rock. And again, it is pot bound. This is one year, it is absolutely rock solid in here. The pots are when they come to this size, rather heavy, but you can see how long I can have this Lelia in this pot without disturbing it. And we've got more roots coming. So this is the first bulb that I grew when I got it into my collection. And it is a little bit stockier, a little bit shorter, but you know, a little bit fatter, that's fine, as opposed to this very large one, long one here. So I fertilize them when they are in active growth. Active growth, including root growth. So this one has been fertilized since I saw this growth starting at 300 parts per million. I know that sounds shocking. It sounds like a lot, but these little guys, even though they're small, their organs, their little pseudobulbs, they really, really do need some substance if grown in cultivation, private, and not out in nature. The rocks and crevices that they find themselves in always have some degrading material in and around the roots constantly, except for the winter when it's constantly being washed away. But in cultivation, in my case, it's by an orchid to orchid basis. What is it doing? 
and 300 parts per million for these little guys, I have not seen any mineral buildup at all on any of my pots. And that tells me that is plenty of fertilizer and they can take it and they're happy with it. 300 parts per million when in active growth, including now root growth. And I do flush every single time before I put in more fertilizer. So what I'm doing now, just to be a little bit more careful as to the hot winds and everything else, something I figured out from last year, is that I will pour RO water through the pot to flush it out. Then I will pour in the fertilized water, but I don't want the fertilized water to dry out on the surface. So I very, very gently flush the surface of the pot with plain RO water again, and don't let the water run out too long. The purpose for rinsing out the surface is so that the fertilized water that went in prior doesn't dry out in the hot air and then leave me with a mineral deposit on the top. So flush, fertilized water goes in and then a rinse across the top, but I don't want to pour too much out because the idea is leave the reservoir with fertilized water in it. And right now I'm doing that every week for all the ones that are growing actively, including roots. New growth. Here's my Kautskiana. Finally, I'm seeing a new growth on my Kautskiana. I was wondering when it would kick into action because the other compadre that looks like this is languishing with only two leaves and two pseudobulbs. And that had me sort of wondering if there's a different behavior quality to the Rapiculus lalius that are long with the underside being the anthocyanin leaves over here with the pseudobulbs of plum color. I was wondering if the attributes are different from these little guys that just seem to take off once they feel they're comfortable in their location. No issues ever with these little guys as opposed to the more longer and slender pseudobulbs on these Rapiculus lalias. But Kautskiana, a new growth. 300 parts per million going into the pot once a week. What I also do, let me see if it's obvious on these pots that I pulled out, probably not. But in order to simulate the sand in the crevices of their natural habitat, I have plain sand, not from the beach, but horticultural sand, fine grade, that I sprinkled over the top every time I had a new Rapiculus lalia in to simulate whatever kind of humidity water retention that could factor in and simulate that with my pot. So on the potting up of a new Rapiculus lalia, at the end, I sprinkled sand on the top where my dew point, so to speak, will hold on to the moisture longer. And then as it dissipated over six months, I would apply that a second time, just a thin layer, not much. It wasn't a complete covering, but I would do it six months later again, and then never to repeat it. And I was trying to make sure that the sandy nature of the crevices where they find themselves in is repeated in my environment with a little bit of that horticultural sand. Added bonus to that, that sand has silica. That's a good little extra boost for the strength and the growth of the cells for these little guys. And this is Giuliani. And Giuliani is growing a new growth right there. Important because it is not quite established in the pot yet. And I've had this now over a year. So you can see that nothing has desiccated on these pseudobulbs here. The orchid is not established or rooted into the pot properly. I do have some going in. I have a new growth that had already established itself in this last year. I have a new one growing. They are very, very robust if you get a healthy one in. And I can only say that lava rock with some terrarium grit, in my case, the occasional sprinkle of sand in a semi-hydro setup is absolutely perfect especially the hotter it gets. Because even in nature, they don't want their roots to burn on those hot rocks. 
So the roots will go into all these little crevices and seek out wherever it could still be damp and cool. You know, you don't want to burn the roots in that hot sun. So they do go where there is moisture and where it is cooler for them during the hot months of the year. So this is crispy labia. Finally, another new growth. I have two growths from within the year that I had it. Blind sheaths, no matter, doesn't matter. But this one is much more vigorous and it is totally pot bound, which is great. So I have this one in a tiny little different pot. I couldn't find all the white ones that I wanted, but the same principle applies. I have in the bottom terrarium grit, possibly ceramus still from when I used to have ceramus, and then small lava rock all around the top. And in the year, oh, here's a little bit of residue of sand. In the year that I've had it, this is my second sprinkle of sand that has already dissipated. If I have to repot this one, I'm sure that in the reservoir we're going to find quite a lot of sand accumulation, but with all the flushing, it also starts to spill out bit by bit. This is a happy little orchid. I love it and I look forward to seeing this one here possibly bloom. The flowers are really pretty. I can't show you flowers on the ones that I have here on the table. But again, I wanted to show the ones that Matt by Nature and I have in common so that we have a comparison and we can see how they're doing. The flowers are really pretty. They look like little gems of yellows and pinks and whites. I have bloomed the Regentii, I have bloomed the Ensfelsii and the Harpophila. So I'm getting them to an age now where they can bloom. But I just wanted to point out this one, the foliage is all green. Nothing on the backside, not necessarily because it hasn't got enough sun, because all these live together in the same location and have the same light level. In contrast, there's this one also with a little bit more of a reddish tinge to the leaves. And in the same time that I've had these two, the ones with a little bit of red in the tinge of the leaves are not as easy or readily wanting to establish themselves with roots in the pot. Mind you, once they get going, they'll be fine. But it is a little bit of a fine balance to make sure that A, you have a healthy one so that you can get it to grow a new growth. And if, as in this case, and those types there as well, if they are reluctant to grow roots, keep misting. Because when it's in the hot, dry season, they are, again, there is a hot, dry season, what they call the drought. But there is a dew point, and that is what they sustain themselves with out in their habitat by what is the dew overnight. Coming into the time of year where it is going to get hotter and hotter, that terracotta warms up fast, and I will miss them at around 7.30, 8pm to simulate the dew point they would have out in nature. As the nights are warmer, they will be dry by the morning, and then when I come back down in the morning, the first thing I do is I mist them once again with plain RO water to give them that simulation of dew again. So drought doesn't necessarily mean set it and forget it. They have to have a certain amount of sustenance, even if in their natural habitat, they wouldn't get any rain whatsoever. And I try to simulate that by misting late evening and early morning, plus my usual repeat routine. But there's something to be said about the dew point, especially with the ones that are a little bit reluctant to grow roots. It is important to avoid the dehydration through the leaves if they are slower to grow roots. These structures need to stay plumped up. So the misting also helps to avoid too rapid dehydration of the leaves by maintaining enough humidity around them. They can tolerate the drought. If in doubt in winter, then I do not water. If it's too cold for three days and three nights in a row, and that for me is 14 degrees during the day, that is a cold day in my winters. Five degrees during the night, that is not a cold night, that is normal. But if I have back-to-back -back cold days of 14 degrees Celsius, I don't water. There's enough humidity in the air to sustain them, except if one is in active growth. 
then I will water, but I will not be misting. I will apply the water directly into the pot and do my flush. The reason I'm not misting during the winter is because I don't have that high airflow during the winter as I do now to counteract the high humidity that I have in the winter. Again, mine do not live out in the wild. In the wild, they would have all the airflow. It could be high humid, it could be pouring with rain. There's no worries with regards to rotting any new growths. I don't have that in cultivation. I have very high humidity, possibly hardly any wind, and it's cold. So that is where I try to back off on the misting. The humidity is high enough, but I do water if in active growth. And if it's not in active growth, then I just monitor to make sure that the roots are not dying. And I do that just by watching the pseudobulbs. These pseudobulbs are, tell a story all the time. If they are starting to get a little bit shriveled, the leaves, for example, with regards to my flava here, last year it was languishing, and this leaf started to sag, and it's never recovered. And I used to have these ridges. Sorry for the dusty leaves, I hardly wash my Rapiculus lalias because if they're not pot bound, I don't want to be yanking on the leaves. But I hope you can see the ridges here. You can see sort of wrinkles in the leaf. These used to be so much more obvious and predominant last year when I potted this one up. And finally though, it has plumped up and we can see, let me show you. We can see that part of its characteristic is to have wrinkled leaves because this is a healthy, fully grown, beautifully rooted in new growth. So there is a, a texture to the leaves that looks wrinkled and dehydrated, but it is not. So the story that they tell you, if they are not getting enough misting, humidity or water, the leaves will flop like that. And then unfortunately in my case, it didn't perk up again or recover. I could go on a lot longer. I, I love these guys. If I have 50% of all the species, I have a long way to go to source more, but it is my aim to see if I can ever achieve collecting all the species that I find on the lists that I do not have. They don't take up much space. What's not to love? <laughs> they are such a joy to watch grow when these little new growths come out at the base. They are so cute. When I started with these, I was operating on what happens if life has another effect as with other collections. What am I gonna do? And so these are my plan B if life were to throw me a curveball again and I would need to give up all the big orchids that I have. I can keep my Rapiculus lalias because they will fit on a windowsill scattered around a smaller home. So this is my plan B, and at the moment, I'm really gunning for them. I'm trying to collect as many as I can, because just in case, you never know. They are a pleasure. I wouldn't say that they are necessarily easy, but if you get a healthy one in, then you are already 80% on your way to success. I have talked a lot. I thank you for your patience. I also want to thank Matt by Nature, Patricia's Orchids, Nicole Diana for joining me today with their Rapiculus Lelia videos as well. I am excited to see their orchids, like some kind of a geek, you know? Let's see what the other ones are doing. Let's see what Matt by Nature's orchids look like. I like to compare. I like to learn from others. Maybe there are things I can pick up and maybe there are things that you can pick up if you are interested in this genus and if you have them or don't have them yet. I encourage you to go and check out their videos and the links will be in the description below. Thank you once again to the three channels that have joined me today. If there are any questions whatsoever regarding what I was just talking about, please feel free to leave your comments, your questions, everything in the comments section below. And know that I thank you for your time if you've made it this far. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.